Welcome to Provence, the land of blue skies, pink rosé wine, pastis, and every year or two a novel by Peter Mayle. Recently we've had the vintage caper, the Marseille caper, and the Corsican caper, but this year it's the diamond caper. I just wanted to find out what sort of a day you have when you're writing a book, how it all well, works for you. Usually we'll walk with the dog. I'm up in my office by nine usually, and I work through, usually without taking any phone calls or doing anything like that, until 12 o'clock. Sorry to interrupt, is it a tidy office? Frightfully tidy. It's very tidy. I can't stand untidiness. Revisit what I've written at six o'clock, throw half of it away, and start again the next day. Wow. One of the things that a wonderful man I used to work for, called David Ogilvy in America, an advertising man, he said, you must learn to murder your darlings. Now let's take this book, the latest novel, The Dharma Caper. How did it start? Where did this, this well, whole story of the Dharma Caper begin? It was two or three years ago. You could hardly pick up a newspaper, a local newspaper, without seeing the headline saying, another jewellery theft. And they were sort of little modest ones of two or three million dollars. And then eventually it got up to some huge amount of money. I think the New York Times said it was 136 million. What had fascinated me was not just the fact that it was a huge amount of money, but they'd never caught anybody. <laughs> no, still now they haven't caught anybody. I thought if I were trying to rob Cartier in Cannes, for instance, how would I go about it? And that's where it started, and uh, I found a vehicle that I think yeah. would work. And then you get all these lovely characters. And there's one particular character in the book that I thought she was really intriguing, and I wanted to meet her, which is, she's called Coco. Yes. I won't spoil it for the reader, but I really sort of rather fancied Coco. <laughs> well, I mean, she's a mixture of about two or three women mm. that I've known. But she's also a sort of, I would almost say, stereotypical person in what she does and mm. how she looks and how she behaves and everything yeah but that, that doesn't make her any less attractive no. but it um well it's because she knows what she wants e exactly yes all these characters also need to be fed and watered they do indeed just like us just like us yeah and there's such a real thrill is what they eat and where they go and what they drink and there's well, a i mean i've always thought that Eating and drinking get very poor treatment in most fiction books. In fact, I don't think it's really ever discussed. No, they have a sandwich in the back of a car or something, and I think, well, that's not what you want to do. I like to have well-fed characters. Where we are sitting in the most beautiful part of France, this has influenced your writing. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's my material. Yeah. When I look at what other people have to do to get to where they work, or to get to their work, and you think of buses and trains and aircraft and God knows what else. Taking your trousers off for the immigration people and all that stuff. And I live near the office. Mm. Well, I mean in the office, mm. really. Such a joyous read. I mean, as I said, the characters are so rounded. The food is delicious. <laughs> the wine I could drink all day. Uh, it's everything I, everything I want to read about. Good luck with it. Thank you so much, Nigel. It's and very, thanks for very having kind me down here. Thank you. And we'll be back, you'll be back again. Oh, God, well, I'll be sponging again, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Great Thank you very much. <laughs>